38 pounds in the black corner. From St. Louis, Mr. Crow. Andre the Giant. Gonna get his legs set on the bruiser. The greatest WWE champion of all time, and in many ways, the man who made the title what it is today, Bruno Sammartino. His opponent, weighing 236 pounds in the white corner, from Van Nuys, California. Welcome in to another edition of Retro Wrestling Rewind. Man, this week, we are talking SummerSlam in the year 1993. What the hell were you doing back in 1993, Mr. Alex J? I was 11 years old in 1993. This is the final pay-per-view. Um, actually, the second to last pay-per-view I would watch from the WWF until well into the Attitude Era. I watched this show, and I watched WrestleMania 10 live, and I didn't watch a live WWF pay-per-view for quite a while. I was all in. Part in the pun I mean, on WCW. What, what what made you switch from from the uh, the federation to uh, world crappy wrestling? I mean, world championship wrestling. I mean, I think you know, becoming eleven, losing Hulk Hogan, which doesn't seem like it seems like it seems weird, right? But I was a Hulk of fucking maniac. Shit, there's no Ultimate Warrior. Like Savage is not wrestling. The guys that I grew to love as a child. Or getting older and they're not wrestling or not in the top spots. You know, the gimmicks are lame even for an 11 year old at the time. And it was like, I, I just preferred some of the newer stars that they had in world championship wrestling at the time, especially a young, stunning Steve. Yeah, I mean, it was a, I mean, it was a good pay per view. I mean, it happened August the 30th, 1993, in Auburn Hills. Before we get into that, you know what the first pay per view I watched back in the WWF? It was King of the Ring uh, 2000. No, it was In Your House, Final Four. And the reason why I got that pay-per-view because it was like Steve Austin's first shot to win the WWF Championship because they had a Final Four gimmick. The last four guys from the Royal Rumble because Austin had run the Royal Rumble, but he won it after he already got eliminated, but the referees didn't see it. So that – because Austin was my man. And like, and that's the reason why I started getting back into WWF because I see a lot of the guys that I liked in WCW coming over here. Your Dustin Rhodes – your your McFoley's and your Steve Austin's especially. Yeah, I mean it was. I mean, I remember uh, taking my uh, my girlfriend, now my wife, back to a pay per view at West Palm Beach. It was an in your house pay per view, and um, yeah, it included Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, what were your thoughts on those old in your house pay per views? They were kind of gimmicky and kind of. Yeah. I didn't watch a whole lot of them to be honest until you know eventually these became you know full pay per views. But they originally were, there were two hours. They were fourteen dollars and ninety five cents, and the whole gimmick, like the, the gimmick of the first ones, that they would give away a house, right? That was the whole deal. They're gonna give away a house in Florida. I don't know what happened with the house. I don't know if they really got the house or whatever. Or it was just a gimmick, much like the Rolls Royce that they gave away, the wrestling classic. I don't know if that person actually got it. Are you trying to say it could have been a gimmick? Yes, it could have been. It, a it was. I mean, it was a good pay per view. I mean, they had my favorite commentator, not Vincent Kennedy McMahon. They had Bobby the Brain Heenan. Um, it's it's kind of funny. Gorilla Monsoon and Jim Ross were there, but they weren't on television, which is weird. They had I'm looking at Wikipedia. It said Radio WWF. Like who the hell? Yes. They had wrestling on the radio. I didn't know that was. I didn't know that was a thing. They did. It wasn't widely available throughout the country, so not a lot of people got it. And the tapes, because I want to listen to the tapes. I want to hear. Jim Ross and Gorilla Monsoon like yeah. call this pay per view. They're not out there, and that's a shame. I wish the WWE in some form or fashion will release those tapes. Yeah, I, I mean, it was, it's it's kind of like one of those things uh, when you go to a live event and you don't hear the commentary. I wish there was a way to, you know, rent like if you go to like a stock car race or any kind of event, you can rent like a headset or something and listen to the commentary. That would be kind of cool to be at an event and hear hear the commentary. But it's it's one of those things. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's. And hopefully, if they did that, we get rid of some of the shitty chants that oh, they have yeah. now. Well, you know what they need to get rid of? The damn lights that were shining at you at WrestleMania. Oh my god! That's beside the, the point. Worst. But um, yeah, I mean, it was a great. Can we talk about the motherfucking Lex Express right off the bat? I want to talk about Lex Express because this is SummerSlam '93. The Lex Express breaks down on the way to Detroit, Michigan, and you know, I've never, ever 
in the history of me watching wrestling seen someone be elevated and pushed to such a degree and then nothing happens. My good friend Tom says the equivalent of blue balls, which is true. It's oh, very it's true. true. It's damn true. I mean, why do you think that was, why do you, you think know, this happened? I mean, I think they pivoted, which is strange because I often compare this push to Roman Reigns' push and Hulk Hogan's initial push, right? And the case of Roman Reigns, everyone that could see it wasn't working, but they never pivoted. They just kept on going straight and they kept on getting fucking buried by the crowd. Hogan, on the other hand, had a longer push that was presented over time. What they did with Luger is they tried to get eight years of Hulk Hogan's push in eight weeks, and it was overblown. Now, I went back and watched the prior six Monday Night Raws to this show, right? Basically starting a little bit before they did the, the big body slam challenge on the Intrepid. To right up to the pay-per-view. And I can tell you from watching those televisions, oh my God, Lex Luger comes across so disingenuous. He comes across like this is so forced, like he hates doing this. And it never really kind of made sense. So you had this guy who was the narcissist. And he was a narcissist at King of the Ring. Right? Yeah. He's the narcissist. He was the narcissist the week before he slammed Yoko Izuna. And he just basically gets in the helicopter and <laughs> slams Yoko. Now, if you watch the Intrepid special, which is interesting to note, when the helicopter is coming, everyone is chanting for Hogan. Now, clearly, Lex Luger is going to take Hogan's spot. He's going to take Hogan's character, which is very strange because Hogan, if you go over his entire run, he was very patriotic, but that was one aspect of his character. To be completely honest, we didn't really get to see that until like late 84. He's already been in the Federation for 10 months. We don't see that until Slaughter leaves and Hogan's taking on some of these foreign heels, like Nikolai Volkov in the flag match. Then we kind of really got to get to see the Hogan patriotic side. But Hogan would only be Mr. Flag wearing, waving USA when he's facing a foreign heel. Now we go back and we look at Luger. He's wearing the colors of the flag. He's missed made in America. Lex Luger. And that's not going to work if he's in a feud with Shawn yeah. Michaels. That's not going to work if he's in a feud with Razor Ramon. So you can only program him with, as this character, with foreign menaces which they didn't have a whole lot of. Now, Ludwig Borg is here, and he wasn't going to last very long, and that's it. You can feud him with Ludwig Borg, the Quebecers, more Yoko, maybe Giant Gonzalez if you really wanted to. That's going to be <laughs> awful. So it made his character very one-dimensional, and that was an issue. So they chose, they made the right decision to pivot away. They never pivoted away from Roman Reigns, and they just watched him get booed and booed and booed at pay-per-views. So much like they pivoted away from Lex Luger and went back to Bret Hart, in terms of Roman Reigns, they should have pivoted away from Roman Reigns and went back to – couldn't go back to Daniel Bryan because he was hurt, but to someone else. Yeah, I mean it was – Most likely AJ Styles. Oh, God, I'm not, uh, I'm not a big fan of him. I mean with his – He's your neighbor, and I understand I mean, why you're not a fan of him. He's got that mom haircut. I mean, come on. Like, seriously, dude? Well, they can change his hair, for Christ's sake. Hey, I'll tell you what. Let's be honest here. If Luger came into the WWF as a total package Lex Luger, that's, you can make a, a leap from total packages to Made in the USA Lex Luger, but going from the narcissist Lex Luger to Made in the USA was yeah, too I mean, big of a leap. It's one of those things. I mean, it, what, it, like you said, it wasn't like many months that it happened. It's just like... It, it was at yeah, a drop of a dime. Now let's go back. Let's go back and talk about Luger here for a second, because this is important. Luger debuts in the WWF in nineteen ninety two, but he's not in the WWF, he's in the WBF. Gets in that motorcycle wreck, has to get the uh, metal plate in his elbow. But doesn't wrestle. He's in the WWF. He works for Titan. He's wanna be a dick about it. He works for Vince McMahon for an entire year without wrestling. 
So not only, not only is he like this goofy narcissist character, he has a ton of ring rust because he hasn't wrestled for about a year. And hell, at the end of his WCW, he didn't wrestle a whole bunch either because stipulated in his contract was only a certain amounts per year and he was way past that. So right before he dropped the belt, you never really saw him. Yeah, well, that's I mean, all they, they call that the Brock Lesnar now, but... Which, yeah. which, which, unfortunately, <laughs> he is current. He's the new Universal. Ch- ah, hey, no spoilers, sorry. motherfucker. He's uh, he's uh, wrestling tonight on the pay per view. So maybe I don't know. I'm not gonna spoil anything for you. So no, I don't give a fuck. It's WWE. It's been spoiled for a long time. Let's be yeah, honest. Yeah. It's like WWE is like curdled milk. Oh. You can still drink it, but it's gonna give you the shits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not going to kill you, but I mean, speaking of something, I don't really understand it. Okay. So Owen Hart, he's in this pay-per-view, but he's in a dark match against, uh, Barry Horowitz. I mean, yeah, horrible. Wins. Wow. That's why he's the call. Well, why did they put him in a dark match? I mean, he was, he's not doing anything. He's a fucking mid Carter. He wouldn't get his push for the next year. He's still essentially high energy. Owen Hart. Yeah. I mean, it was, a. Uh... Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, Owen Hart being the most coveted free agent of 1988, 89, 90, and 91. And he would have tryout matches and stuff with you know, with WCW, but they never really put the trigger on him for whatever reason. So he's basically, you know, Coco beware level here. So that's why he's on the dark match. Now let's talk about the TVs okay. leading up to this. And I want to talk about how TV has changed over the years. Now, I understand that it's 1993. Monday Night Raw is only an hour long. Not live, although they would try to pretend that sometimes it would be live. But for the most part, it's not live. It's at, the, it's at the Manhattan Center every once in a while, but not every time. And they would tape two shows back to back. And you could tell they taped two shows because Macho is literally wearing the same outfit. Now, you look at modern television, it's three hours long. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of Star Wars Star matches. Now, on these Raws that I watched in 1993, you would have three or four squash matches and then two Star vs. Star matches. So you would get a Bret Hart versus Bam Bam Bigelow or Shawn Michaels versus Marty Jannetty on these shows, and that's great. But what make these shows impactful is the way – they will insert some of the packages Whoa. for the feuds, oh. some of the packages for then some of the vignettes. Shut up. Some of the vignettes of the guys who were debuting. We saw on, on TV, I saw the debut of Men on a Mission. Owen Mabel. You know what I mean? Owen Mabel, who uh, sidetracked on Men on a Mission for a minute. I listened to rap music in 1993, and Men on a Mission were rapping like it was 1983. Ridiculous. They were not going to get over. Sorry. Moving on. So you look at television back then. A couple squash matches, lots of interviews, and, 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 a, and a solid, solid main event. You see main events like Brent versus Bam Bam, Randy Savage versus Doink, but they're all intertwined in a feud. And the way that they wrote television made so much sense. And it's so clear. And it goes from one week to another. And they take their time and they're very patient. Like they did this Randy Savage Doink feud that I don't, I don't even remember, but it's done really well because Doink was feuding with Crush. Crush is Randy's friend. Crush gets crushed by Yoko, and he's out with an injury. So they put Savage and Doink together, and then he brought out the midget Macho Boy, which is ridiculous, and and all hell broke loose, and it was fantastic. And then you had the Razor Ramon face turn, which is over several weeks of when he lost to the one, two, three kid. All the other heels started making fun of him for losing to the one, two, three kid, which ended up Razor Ramon gets in Ted DiBiase's face. The one, two, three kid challenges DiBiase in the match. One, two, three gets the win. And now Razor Ramon's making fun of Ted DiBiase, and it would lead up to the match here at SummerSlam 93. Everything 
was planned out very meticulously, unlike television today. Now, I'm not saying that you can go back and put the genie in the bottle. The horse has left the barn. But there's some things that you can take away from 1993 television that you can incorporate in a Monday Night Raw or a AEW Wednesday Night Dynamite or whatever. And the squash matches are very important. And here's why. We all have wrestlers on our roster. Well, let me rephrase that. Every wrestler currently on the roster has fans. So somewhere out there, there's a, Kurt, there's, there's, a, there's a contingent of Kurt Hawkins fans or a contingent of Zack Ryder fans. And they're not going to want to watch Raw if they see them lose on Raw every single week. It's ridiculous. So you got to have those squash matches that get these guys wins on television. It gets their character over. And it will get their finishing maneuver over as well. And you can take your time and explain who they are. And then once they get to the next level, maybe they're fighting for over a belt, IC belt, or what have you. You know, you have, they're established. Heck, back in the day, I used to watch superstars all the time. I saw more Coco Beware squash matches when he's squashing jobbers than I've seen Hulk Hogan matches on television. And you can't get any lower on a roster than Coco Beware. He's the barometer. If it's any lower, it's a jobber. And he would win all the time on TV. Are you trying to say? You're... So I think you're I think you're I think you're doing your fans a disservice by not getting these guys squash wins on television against local talent. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's I mean I know people say it'll be boring if you do that. It won't be boring if your commentators are good and your characters are interesting. And right now they have a roster full of guys who are not over. That's just the bottom line. Because Stone Cold said so? No, I'm just saying. Oh, yeah, because Stone Cold said so, because Arn Anderson said so. I don't know. He got a pair of scissors. He's getting stabbed by Sid. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, it's, you, beyond the, uh, the first match, which we didn't see, we had Razor Ramon taking on a, on a debuting Ted DiBiase <laughs> in the WWF. So, I mean, I mean, what are your thoughts on this match? I mean, Teddy, Teddy's leaving. This is Teddy's last match. So Teddy's done after this. He goes, he, he wrestles a little bit in Japan, goes to all Japan, tags with Stan Hansen. But this is it for Teddy. He's done. So Razor gets the win, establishes himself as a new baby face, and we're off and running. Yeah, man. What, what, were you a fan of Ted DiBiase's uh, character or back then? Like He was great in um, you know Mid-Atlanta or Mid-South. Yeah. Mid-South. He was great. Because everyone was better in Mid South. Yeah, most people. But um, no, I like the Million Dollar Man. I I liked him because I hated him as a kid. That he was a jerk, but he's such a good wrestler, such a good promo, and his hair. Did Did you hate him because he of the uh, promo that he did where he kicked out all the kids out of the pool and he was on the diving board? I think it was the one. The one that got me was when they had the kid who was bouncing the basketball. And he was going to make it, and Ted DiBiase kicked yeah. the ball away. That got me right there. Yeah, there Fuck that guy. He's there, a piece there was of shit. one time they did uh, uh, one of those things, and it ended up being a wrestler, a future wrestler. I'm not sure who it was. I think it was. Oh yeah, it was Rob, Rob Van Dam. Uh, just that's just funny and the... sucking on Teddy's toes like he was Tony Atlas or Mel Phillips. Tony Atlas likes to suck toes. Tony Atlas likes to have women step on his face and get some. Uh, Sexually aroused. Damn. Could have got somebody to do that at WrestleCon, but I mean, I, I didn't. Oh well. Yeah. Every once in a while, go watch, go watch some uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling. Uh, Tony Atlas will wear a shirt of his face with women's feet on it, like stepping on it. He is weird, but that's yeah. Yeah, that's I know. your friend. I mean, he's a good guy. Mister Fucking USA, Tony Atlas. They should have brought him back to fight you. I mean, yeah, he was. He was. He was in WCW yeah, at this I mean, time. They could have brought a lot of people. You know, to face Yokozuna, but I didn't buy it. See, I, they tried to, I guess, ghetto Tony Atlas up a little bit, like make it more street. I guess is the, I guess, in the inappropriate word to use for this. Um, it never worked because I never bought Tony Atlas as a thug or a hood. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just, he just didn't come across. He's like, he's, he's too nice of a guy. He, he shouldn't even never been yeah. a, a heel anyway. You know, but that's you, know, you know who could be a, a heel oh, or was a heel and is a heel in, in real life? Just guess. My favorite wrestler. My wrestler. Just go, just go in front. No. No. Uh, God. Uh, no. What, uh, Zumo? 
Sam Houston? Virgil, I know you hate him. Because you don't like you don't like Olive Garden because you don't like Italian. Yeah, people. that, that you, you you found me out. And I also hate people from Long Island, but that's beside the point. But um A lot of Italians on Long Island, by the way. Yeah. Very Italian and Irish uh, area. You know what I mean? Because everyone's half Italian and half Irish. Like all my friends growing up half Italian and half Irish. God, and th- this this next match uh, had the Steiner brothers, Rick Steiner, Scott Steiner, taking on the heavenly bodies, Jimmy Del Rey and Dr. Tom Pritchard with the man of the hour, Mr. Opinionated Jim Cornette. I mean, it was for the t- uh, tag team titles. I mean, what were your thoughts on the heavenly bodies? I mean, Heavenly Bodies are on loan from Smoky Mountain Wrestling at this time. They eventually get contracts. I'm not sure if they're the tag team champions at this point, although they very much mm-hmm. might be. So they're doing like this talent trade with Smoky Mountain. But I don't want to talk about the debut of Jim Cornette's, which takes place a couple of okay. weeks before their show. So Jim Cornette just storms the ring kind of out of nowhere. And like you have Bobby and, and Vince are like, who's that? And and then Bobby is like, oh, you know who that is? And then like Vince is like, yeah, it's Jim Cornette. And then Bobby the Brain Heenan goes in the ring, grabs a microphone, and says, "Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to present to you the greatest manager of all time, Jim Cornette." And they embrace and they hug, and and Corny gets the big, you know, the big thumbs up from Bobby as being the greatest manager of all time. And they and and then Corny cuts the promo, and he's going to be the uh, the American spokesperson for Yoko, and he's bringing in the, the bodies in the fight the Steiners. He does a little bit of commentary with Vince and Bobby, which is yeah, awesome. I mean, I, I still I still find it funny how he was the American spokesman for Yokozuna. That's just uh, who who is essentially American, and so is Fuji. Yeah, because Fuji's from Hawaii. His first name is Harry. Yeah, I mean, and Yoko is is Samoan, which is yeah. the American territory. It's just it. Can we talk about how weird it was, the anti-Japanese sentiment in the early 90s in the United States, not to get too political, but there was a lot of movies going on. There's a Michael Keaton movie where he works for like an auto auto plant, and, and you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, a lot of Japanese corporations were coming to America and buying buildings, buying corporations. They bought the Mariners, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. So there's very much like, oh... The Japanese people are buying, you know, buying all our shit, and we're pissed. And I think that's what Vince was going for here. And it's very bizarre, and it's very like Wall Street Journal type shit, and not very eleven uh, year old Alex watching wrestling. I mean, it, it was. I mean, back when I first started watching wrestling back in the mid '80s, I mean, they did that crap all the time. I mean, they would, you know, talk about, you know, with the Iron Sheik and uh, Iran and. Well, I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about foreign okay. menaces in general. That's always You're been talking about Japanese. About wrestling. I'm talking about just 90s Japanese because they went away from using Pearl Harbor as a reason to hate the Japanese. They're, now they're talking about, you know, you know, the Japanese car industry and the Japanese corporations yeah. buying yeah. all this shit. And that was a really that that went way over my head when I was a kid. Obviously, I know what they're talking about when they talk about it today. Um, just like how uh, Hiro Masuda bought. The rights to the Four Horsemen, essentially, and they because they did the same the similar thing in WCW. That was terrible. Was that was a t- the Yamagatsi Corporation. Oh, that was right. They had RoboCop. Was it RoboCop Three? They had that when the Japanese company bought OCP, and then they had the fucking RoboCop fight a ninja and shit. So it was very, it's very pop culture relevant for the late yeah. '80s, early '90s. And I always thought that was weird. Do you think the Steiner Brothers fit in WWF nope. at all? It's, they seem very WCW to be in the WWF. Yeah, I mean, just their look. I mean, they just didn't... They didn't change anything about them. Which, historically, when they change gimmicks, is a bad thing. But I think the Steiners need Yeah, I mean, some. even... I mean... She gave him a dog, like Matilda um, or something. I mean, like just ch- at least change their name. I mean, that's what they did with the, you know, the Brain Busters. I mean, they, uh, you know, they didn't change their names, but they just at least changed their, you know, their tag team name. I mean, it was just... But this, the Steiners just... What was their tag team before they were Rainbusters? Do you know what their name was? The Four Horsemen. Oh, no, they were Hard Hairs <laughs> yeah, and Tully Blanchard. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that. <laughs> they gave him a name and then put him with, with Bobby, Bobby Heenan. Yeah, he awesome. will go down as the greatest manager in the history of this great sport, but I'm just, and he's a great commentator, but, you know. Better than the Grand Wizard? Yes, really? he's better than, he's better than Master Fuji. He's better than, uh, Lassie? Yep, he is, um, 
Gary Hart? No. I, I'm a. You don't know, think? I think he's better than Gary Hart. Right? Say Gary Hart didn't take any bumps. Yes, Bobby Heenan is the greatest manager of all time. You th- it's Bobby one, and then tied for second is Cornette and Heyman. And I think most people now would put Heyman above Cornette for the stuff that he's doing. Yeah, currently. I mean, so. kind of the. Uh, I, I see it. Um, you know, Bobby Heenan is a great commentator. And then I got Todd Pettengill. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Je- Todd Pettengill was never a commentator. Okay, so, sorry, a backstage announcer. Todd Pettengill is a big deal here in New York, so don't say anything bad what, about that is Todd terrible? Pettengill. No, he's like one of the biggest DJs in New York City. I'm, like he's on the radio. He's fucking fan- I'm fantastic. Sure, I'm, WPRJ. I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. But uh, the Steiners, I mean, they just and they had and they had the tag titles. I mean, they had the tag titles because they're feuding with Money Inc. Money. What are your thoughts on Money Inc.? I mean, I don't know. Does it make sense? I don't know if it makes sense. It's like you're gonna have the rich guy and the tax man. I, I mean, know, I think weird. it kind of makes sense. I mean, you have if the if the tax guy is in cahoots with a rich man, then that kind of yeah. But why was he a tax guy? Why couldn't he just be Michael Wall Street? It make more sense that oh, he's going to invest Ted DiBiase's money and then try to, instead of taking away from Ted DiBiase because he has to pay taxes because he's I rich. Don't know. Not that the rich people pay a lot of taxes, but they probably need polls. I don't know. Everybody that I know that's rich pays a lot of taxes, but that's beside the point. Uh, but yeah, I mean. Uh, I think you fucking New York. You know? God, no, that's all I Jeez, you pay a lot for everything. But I mean, Jimmy Del Rey. I mean. I love Jimmy Del Rey, right. by the way. The gigolo, he's fantastic. And when he does this gyration motion, I literally throw up in my mouth, but I, I mean, love but, every second of it. <laughs> Did you like them better here in the WWF more than Smoky Mountain? I mean, of course not. That's ridiculous. But you know who... That's that's even ridiculous to me because the heavenly bodies with the top heels and Smoky. Of course, they're going to be but better. You, you know, a place that someone was not better at in was in Smoky Mountain was Chris Jericho. And the Chris Jericho, he he was good. He got hurt. Not his. Not it's not Smoky's fault that he broke his arm trying to do a shooting I mean, star I mean, press. It, and then he went back to Canada. I mean, he was only I mean, there for a small time. But those videos are gross. You ever watch the videos with, with Lance and, and Jericho? Uh, no. weird. Um, Smoky Mountain, I mean, now that I look back at it, at the time I didn't think it was crap. But like now that I look at it, it's like the, the it was such low production value. You know, the kind of corny stuff they did. But now, back then I didn't really, I didn't give two shits because, you know, I was, you know. Smoky was like... Like a an alternate version of like Continental and Memphis because it's very similar to that. And then any promotion that's going to have Bob Cottle and Dutch Mantel's or commentators is going to be good. They had Lance Russell every once in a while. Um, I wouldn't necessarily suggest like going back and watching their TVs. Um, they're good, but I wouldn't suggest doing that. If you want to get a feel for what Smoky Mountain was really about, you watch the Night of Legend yeah. shows. And like they they bring in names and you know it's not like isn't you're not watching Tony Anthony taking on Brian Lee, basically you're not they have they actually have really good matches. You know who my favorite tag team uh, in Smoky Mountain was? Yep, the Gangsters. I just fucking there was a promo they they did when Cornette tried to try tried to um, you know buy their uh, their services and uh, it was such a racist gimmick. I mean a racist statement that New Jack said about. You know, white people oh, yeah. and slaves and ships and, you know, I don't need no. They were really like, like corny, like, you know, he saw New Jack and you see what New York is saying is like, I'm going to bring New Jack to the deep south to get heat. And it was like, it was the wrong type of heat because it wasn't like we want to watch. We don't want to pay money to watch the Rock and Roll Express beat you up. We're just not going to come. I mean, to I, mean I, I did hear that. I mean, in some stories that I've heard and read, that they did. I mean, they legitimately like the fans like wanted to kill kill New Jack and Mustafa. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, New Jack he's riding up to the arena in his Corvette with the Malcolm X X license plate on it, and and it, it's and and they were the original Nation of Domination because it's the gangsters and it's it's yeah. D'Lo Brown, you know, doing that gimmick, and not that they called it the Nation of Domination, but they clearly got the. The idea was inspired by what they were doing down in Smokey. And, you know, New Jack, amazing talker. Not the best wrestler in the world, but he credits the Rock and Roll Express for teaching him how to work. 
Like he credits them one hundred percent. I mean, that's that's yeah. I mean, I think the Rock and Roll Express they helped a lot of people. I mean, I mean, it was. Yeah. I think their gimmick, you know, back in the mid nineties, especially in, I mean, especially in Smoky Mountain. I mean, they were fucking in T- Knoxville, Tennessee, in that area. I mean, not you know, not to sound bad, but it's just like they, I don't know. It's just there were a lot of racist people in that area, and they. they in nineteen ninety three. Probably today, yeah, but they were tailor fucking made for ECW. Oh God, yeah, I mean, for I mean, sure. Could you have seen Sandman in Smoky Mountain? Sandman, Sandman works anywhere. By the way, um, I was gonna talk about this on the other show that we're, we're going to record uh, sooner than later. Um, I think in two thousand one, if they brought the Sandman in the WWF, he would have been the most over on the roster. He is like this weird, ridiculous charisma. Like, look when they brought him in for the new ECW. Now, a lot of guys will shit on it. But when they moved fucking Salmon over to Raw, he was fucking over his shit. And this is like when his body got really bad. Like, if you watch the Sandman at the end of ECW in like 2001 or 2000, he is fucking jacked. Like, he looks kind of like Lex Luger. Like, he looks fucking huge. And he has this weird charisma that works. He didn't need the beer, the cigarette, or the cane. He still would have got over. And Gary fucking Yeah, I mean, he it. was definitely, definitely ever. But um, but then they, then guys go back and forth between Smokey and ECW, Tracy Smothers, uh, Tommy Rich, Kevin Sullivan. So there was a lot of guys going back and forth. Chris Candido worked both places. Jericho worked both places. Lance Storm worked both places. So there was really like... You know, it's 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 an an ideology. It's basically ECW and Smokey were 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 essentially Paul Heyman's vision of professional wrestling and Jim Cornette's vision of professional wrestling. Yeah, I mean it was, and they used a lot of the same talent. Brian Lee, they used Brian Lee. They both used Brian Lee. Yeah, I mean it was definitely a, uh, um, yeah, it was definitely. Uh, There's a weird synergy there, to be honest. I mean, did you? The Heavenly Bodies came in. And Tom Pritchard's talking about cocaine in his promo in ECW. It's weird. Yeah, that's weird. I mean, I mean, what, I just there's it's so different than than it is now. I mean, they couldn't get away with half that crap now. So, but I mean, I think they can get away with quarter. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, look at the shit they're getting with on indie shows today. Yeah, I mean, I mean you. Let's be honest. They, I mean, a lot of it's more, more, more in a comedic fashion, but there's definitely other than you watch them in the deathmatch wrestling or whatever, some of the more hardcore promotions. Yo, they're saying and doing shit that like, ooh, like, ooh. It's, I mean, it's, well, it's pretty out there. I know you're a big deathmatch uh, person. I mean, what? You're a fucking goddamn liar. Why are you saying I thought you said you like the kind of, the kind of, the, Kind of like a CZ, CZW. Do you love? I mean, are you a fan of CZW? I mean, because I, I'm a fan of FMW. I'm a fan of Big Japan. I'm a f- fan of the IWA Japan. Modern deathmatch wrestling. If you can even call it deathmatch wrestling, I don't know if you can even call it that. It's it's not violent. It comes across like guys falling through furniture. Very stuntmanish, yeah. right? Oh, we're gonna we're gonna fight and poorly fight our way to the top of a, a tra- uh, tractor trailer, and then we're both gonna jump off into this web that we've created of barbed wire. Like that's not violent. That's that's very premeditated. Violent is like taking a beer bottle, like where Sabu and 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 Cactus Jack and Sabu is fucking hitting Mick Foley head with the beer bottle is not fucking breaking. <laughs> That's inherently violent. Yeah. Current hardcore wrestling, current, oh, I'm going to hit you with a stick or, oh, I'm going to jump off this thing and land on a table. That's not inherently violent. Um, so it comes across to me like, ah, oh, this is cheese. It comes cheesy to me. I mean, you're right. I mean, so, man. Like the staple gun with the, with the, with the cigarette or the dollar bill, that's, that's cheese to me because – if you're gonna staple gun me in the head, I'm not gonna fucking like kind of just let you staple gun me in the head. It's just it's weird that that's even a thing. Like, yes, I know New Jack did it, and I know that Bubba Ray Dudley did it, but they're literally taking 
elements from what they were doing at ECW and then making that at their whole show and their whole shtick. Yeah. You know what I mean? I didn't really like it when New Jack did it. But New Jack made more sense because he was New Jack, and that's what New Jack did. Like New Jack would come up with a shopping cart full of fucking plunder, and he would hit people with a hockey stick and the balls, and it would be awesome. But you don't see that in modern deathmatch wrestling. You would see there's these really planned spots. And they could hurt like hell, but they don't sell it, so we don't know if it hurts like hell. And we've seen it a thousand times where they're like, ah, whatever, moving on. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, I've never been a big fan of that. I mean, I remember back, back when they did the ta- you know, tape trading. I mean, that, that was, that was kind of big. I mean, yeah, man, I watched like the King of the Dash matches with Foley and Funk and, and the exploding, you know, bomb matches and FMW and, you know, and some of the more, and those are like super violent shit. Like, they even did it in Smokey, where fucking, when Kevin Sullivan uh, fucking stabbed the, the the Japanese dude in the fucking arm, and you see him fucking just slicing his fucking arm, like that's inherently violent. Uh, but a lot of the stuff they're doing today is, is not. It's like it's like a parody of the shit they're doing in ECW. Yeah, I mean, that's what it feels like to me. I mean, yeah. It's not like a fight that turns violent because they hate each other. It's like, oh, there's just two guys. We're just going to jump through this fucking uh, plate glass window. That sounds okay. like, yeah, that just, I don't know, just, that just sounds like it could be uh, inherently bad. I mean, yeah. I mean, I speaking of something you would, was not inherently bad, it's for the Intercontinental title, Shawn Michaels, champion with Diesel. Taking on Mr. Perfect, it was by count out. I mean, well, I don't understand. I mean, Shawn Michaels, Mr. Perfect were so over. Why count out? Well, I think they want to continue this feud, but I don't think they discontinue much longer, to be completely honest. Um, as we all know, and you should know, Mr. Perfect called Shawn Michaels the Intercontinental Championship because Shawn Michaels lost to Marty Jannetty. Uh, they debuting Diesel in, in Albany, New York. Uh, made his debut by uh, costing Marty Jannetty match. Shawn Michaels wins the belt back. So now they're having this Shawn Michaels, Mr. Perfect, IC title match, which was which supposed to be good, but it's not great. Uh, I've seen both guys have better matches. Shawn Michaels, to be completely honest, 1993 Shawn Michaels is not the greatest worker in the world. Sorry. Uh, he wouldn't get that title until like 1995. Um at this point, to be completely honest, I think Marty Jannetty is the better bell-to-bell worker at this point, um, to be completely honest. And I think he was through the entire Rocker run. Um, obviously, Shawn Michaels could do the more flashy shit. He had the more charisma. But as a bell-to-bell worker, Jannetty was much better. Yeah, I mean, I heard he also likes to take things at conventions, but I don't know if Shawn does that. But... He, likes to, he likes to steal in conventions. He likes to sort of like ask people if, they, if, if it's cool for him to have sex with his... Uh, uh, adult daughter, some weird incest thing that he was doing. That was weird. You know, but Marty's way too nice of a guy, and like he like, he's like his own worst enemy. You know, he, like he could have got that push that Sean got too, and they could have been feuding forever, and been on the top of the card all through the '90s. But you know, is Marty liked the party literally, and and it cost them a lot of fucking money. I mean, yeah, I mean, sure. yeah, I mean. Yeah, I was. I mean, I was more of a a Sean fan. I mean, well, you like the blonde boys. That's, so. hey, hey, that's neither here nor there. That's just rumor and innuendo. But it's, it's over. It's over there. Speaking of stuff is. that's not rumor and innuendo, I mean, is it true that I mean that if someone wants to, I guess, get more of your sultry voice and hear your opinion, yeah, sexy Sex. voice and hear your opinions. <laughs> You have a YouTube channel? I mean, I, that's just rumor on the street. I mean, I, I know I've been pit. Everyone knows it's true because everyone, everyone that listens to the show probably watches that channel too. Okay, so if we have a new a new listener on on the podcast, or if they're a wrestling fan and they just forget because wrestling fans are stupid, how do you get how how do you get wow? Them? The wrestling fans are not stupid. They might be unclean. They might be unwashed. And that might be uh, sexual deviance. But I mean, they, they. I mean, there's some wrestling fans who go to, uh, you know, uh, conventions. Not conventions. They go to family reunions to pick up a date. But that's beside the point. 
Who was Some this? People I know in the wrestling business, but I'm not gonna talk about them. I don't throw people under. Th- Who are they trying to pick up, Missy Hyatt? <laughs> Let me find out. Let me find out that you're trying to take Missy yeah. Hyatt on the date, folks. If you if you want to, you know, if you want if you want to hang out with Missy Hyatt, you have to go to one of her uh, Civil War recreation things that she does, because she's really into. Uh, I get. I don't. Know. I don't know if you call it Civil War cosplay i don't know what like they're reenactments called, but... yeah yeah the reenactments the reenactments yeah yeah but she's you know big it's something that. that you know i know that missy's really big into is your your youtube channel how, how that penis how the hell can people get to that they want to go into uh the search bar there and uh on youtube and type in retro wrestling games and we pop up we have 315 videos please watch them all please leave a comment um i don't have bad opinions <laughs> <laughs> they're not they're just wrong. Not right. They're like, 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 okay. I'll give you an example. My opinions are not wrong. Um, you can disagree with them, but they're not inherently wrong because there's also there's like logic behind everything I say. So I'm not going to say something that's completely insane for you to be like you're wrong. You, like the facts of the facts behind my opinions are legitimate. Mm-hmm. Or legitimate enough to make them credible op- opinions, and that's that's the whole basis of what we do. Is not I'm not going to say something that's inherently false, or I'm not going to be intellectually disingenuous to prove a point, um, because everything, all my opinions are, are, are well thought out, and that's what you get from us over at uh, Retro Wrestling Games. It's, it's well thought out wrestling talk. It's well. You know, no one, I've not gotten one comment. And this is YouTube. This is the internet, people. They're saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Your opinion is wrong. That That's not happened. So if you want engaging wrestling conversation, you want something that's a little bit off the beaten path, you want to, you, you're in the fantasy booking or what if scenarios, you're in the history of professional wrestling, you know, starting in 1983, although we do go back farther about that. You want to talk about obscure shit? We talk about obscure shit too, and that's the that's the reality of the situation. So, if you like all that stuff, if you like wrestling video games, we're going to review all of them, ever, ever, ever. every single fucking one. And I'm trying to figure out how to get the screen from the Tiger Electronics WWF game and be able to record it so I can put it on YouTube. That's how deep we're going in, people. You, you you like the Commodore 64? You got yeah. it in television? Hell, you got TurboGrafx-16, Neo Geo. We're going to do those games also. Not just your your Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Xboxes, and Playstations. We're going to do, you know, if there was a wrestling game on the Apple Pippin, which I don't think there was, but if there was one, I was going to go out and buy an Apple Pippin and fucking play that fucking game. Man, you are, I mean, you're really into those, uh, those video games. I mean, so... Well, because I think, I think there was only one channel that ever did it justice. What channel was to be that? Honest. That was uh, Joe Yagney's uh, a Fun Time Arcade. He did a really great job, probably better than I do. It, right? Uh, unfortunately, he stopped, and that's where I'm like, he's not making anymore. So I have to make them now because no one else is making good ones. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you... and plus mine are longer. And because we go, all right, when, t- when it comes to a wrestling video game, right, you can probably only talk about it for about 10 minutes. Because it's, you know, especially the older ones, there's not a whole lot to talk about. You know, you can't be wax poetic about 8-bit graphics for 30 minutes. So we have a video game topic, and then we move on to a secondary topic. So, for example, if we're talking about WWF Superstars for the Arcade, well, that game is based on the stuff that was going on during SummerSlam 89, and we're going to talk about the summer of 1989 in WWF. If, you know, or the In Your House video game for the Sega Saturn and the place, uh, for the PlayStation. Well, we're going to talk about it fucking In Your House because we can only go so long, and I want these to be longer because I don't think in five or ten minutes you can get a full... Um, understanding of graphically visually what the wrestling video game is i think 20 minutes is probably the least you can go they finally get like a full you know deep kind of like look at this thing instead of 
you know, five minutes of, of some gameplay and that's it. <clears throat> Part I mean, but yeah, that's the reality of the situation. You know, we I got some new stuff coming down the pike also uh, for the channel. In addition, we do gameplay videos, just pure raw gameplay video, get gameplay videos. We do them on Marvel Ultimate Alliance right now. We're doing on Fist of the North Star. We're doing the 30th anniversary Street Fighter games. We're doing them all. Welcome. I mean, I, I mean, folks, you, you think that they would only cover wrestling video games? No, they cover all video games. I mean, it's not just not just wrestling video games. I mean, it's a it's a great. Not for nothing. Not for nothing. We did Star Wars Battlefront two, and we did a roundtable discussion on the state of Star Wars with me and four of my closest friends. Yeah, four friends. I think it was five. At least the four or five of my closest friends. Awesome. How'd that go? Yeah, it went well, you know, to record <laughs> five people on Skype can be uh, interesting um, because, like, the internet uh, doesn't hold it well. So sometimes, it, you know, it, the sound quality may not be the best. But the way I did it, I did it like a hardball. So I would take the topic and you go and take the topic and you go and take the topic and you go. And I would have to direct traffic there. But it worked out pretty well. Uh-huh. In addition to that, we did a commentary on on Marvel, Marvel movies, Spider Man in general, with our Spider Man PS4 commentary. So check that out; it's gonna be awesome. Very pop culturey, you know, the kind of the modern the 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 state of uh, the MCU and, and modern comic books. And then we talk about Spider Man and his amazing friends, which is my favorite cartoon. Yeah, I mean, of it's time. I mean, your 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 shit sounds really good. I mean, I, I'll give it to you. I mean. And speaking of shit that um, sounds really good, I mean, I've been getting. I know you, and you made fun of me, and you said it's probably just one person, but I mean, I have been getting a lot of great feedback from my PCO interview that's up on the feed right now. I mean, he, I mean, he was candid, and he, he's, he didn't hold back. I mean, I tried to skirt around some of the stuff, but he was like, "No, I want to talk about it." And, I'll tell you this: I don't bullshit people, right? Because I'm from New York. And if this interview was the shits, I would oh, tell no, you. you. This interview, this no, this interview was really, I mean, really yeah, good. Trust me, folks. I, I was mean, very impressed. This, I mean, guy, if you hey, if you've ever met Alex G and you know him in real life, he doesn't mess around. If, if you if you if you suck, you suck. But speaking of stuff that's, I have no problem with no, biting no. someone in but the face. But you things. know what? Okay, folks, I got a kind of a teaser. We're gonna have another. We're gonna have another interview Ooh. with PCO coming up in the next few weeks. But the only way you can hear it is to go to our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash Retro Wrestling Rewinders. Yeah, I know, folks. You haven't heard us uh, shill or uh, pimp the Patreon page in a while. But you know what? I, I thought. Um, you know what? Uh, we have we have one person that pays every month, um, and so I thought I'd give them a give them a, a good listen. But no, folks, if if you want to hear the unabridged, the it's uh, it, folks. I've already recorded a little bit of it, and I'm editing it. It's a really good interview, but it's gonna be up in the next couple of weeks. So just log on patreon.com forward slash retro wrestling rewinders. Sign up for the tier. We have uh, the Western States Champion tier. That's uh, one of our tiers. We have the Retro Wrestling TV Champ tier. We have the national champion tier and of course we have the retro wrestling world champion tier they all have different uh, benefits different perks i mean of course if you get the world champion you get you get all the shit but any of the tiers you do get uh, you do get content um and uh like alex g always says not for nothing that's going to be one of the t-shirts they're going to be coming out with and if you sign up for one of the tiers can't tell you which one you have to go to patreon.com forward slash retro wrestling rewinders to find out you'll get that t-shirt after a couple of months of uh of being on the site but yeah i mean i mean it's one of those things that the, the quebecers i mean they were a great tag team i mean what were your thoughts on the quebecers i mean they were three-time former wwf tag team champions and but the funny thing is in the interview and you've you you've of course heard and you probably read it online that that the uh, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police Mounted Police were suing Vince McMahon at the time, so that's why they stopped using the Mountie gimmick. Even I, I find that weird because you know I don't know what the parody laws are in in Canada, 
But it's not like the Cobb County police was going to sue Vincent Graham because yeah. they had the big but boss I, man. I think the the the. the you think the, the 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 Mountie is trademarked? Like the like the name Mountie is no, trademarked by them? Because isn't Mountie like yeah? I mean officer? the big boss man. I mean he was kind of a heel sometimes, but they I guess. Yeah, dude, he was like a prison guard who would beat fucking. But fucking I, I guess the Canadians didn't want the kids to think that did not to distrust the uh, the legitimate Mountie, so they said, "Hey, we can't do that." But if you listen to the interview at the end of the interview, I have the Quebecers theme song, a little bit of it, and it's funny as shit. But uh, yeah, I mean, definitely go on to the um, go on to the iTunes, the SoundCloud, the Stitcher. Um, we're on TuneIn. We're on all the uh, podcast platforms, and just you know, just listen to all our stuff. I mean, it's it's been getting a lot of listens. The King of the Rings uh, uh, up there. I mean, we have so many great episodes. We have a crock a cup one. We're in the next, uh, actually, in the next week. Next week, actually, I'm going to be covering a promotion that, if you watch it up on the network, you're going to get shafted. It's uh, ECW. We're going to be covering November to remember 1995. And I mean, do you think that, I mean, this, I'm just a, a guy that just grew up on original music on wrestling, but do you think it takes yeah. away from some of the th- things in wrestling, like NWA stuff, they would take away sharp dress man that, you know, Jimmy jam Garvin came out to, um, um, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. Anyone that used licensed music, yeah, like it hurts. Warriors. Right. It hurts ECW the most. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I mean, and we'll, um, we're going to talk about that. And uh, I mean, it's just going to, it's, it's just a lot of stuff that it, it hurt. But the next match we had on the card, getting back to the to SummerSlam, we had Erwin R. Scheister taking on the one, two, three kid. Your thoughts on on the kid back then and, and um, IRS? Kid's fantastic worker, by the way. Still is. Awesome dude. I was a fan of him when I saw him as the Lightning Kid in Global. He was big in the magazines. He's one of the early, one of the original indie darlings that were out there. So, you know, this match is a offshoot of the DiBiase Razor Ramon match. Obviously, IRS is... DiBiase's partner, Razor and Kid are now friends and buddies, and we have IRS getting the uh, the win here again. IRS as a character is very strange to me at eleven because at eleven years old I don't pay the taxes. So I don't know why this guy is like okay, he's yeah. a bad guy. He says you have to pay your fair share, and and I don't understand it. I'm assuming that Vince had a run in with the IRS in the early nineties, and hence he played uh, this character. I'm assuming he did. I mean. I would like them better as Michael Wall Street because then you can put them right with DBS. You, you didn't like him as uh, Captain Mike Rotunda? No. Did you like him as Syracuse Mike Rotunda? No. I liked him as Barry Windham's tag team partner, Mike Rotunda. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, definitely. The U.S. Express. They were, they were definitely good. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think they should have, they could have kind of not done the IRS gimmick, just Michael Wall Street. I don't understand it. Like I, I'm 11. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't. He wears a, he wears suspenders to the ring and a tie. It's weird. It. And he used to not wear pants. He used to wear brown fucking tights, and it looked stupid. So they finally put him in dress pants. Uh, and he wore a tie. I mean, it's just weird. It's just. He wore a tie. Should have been a clip on though. Cause they could have done, like they did spots with the tie every once in a while, but. You know, you have the clip on. Like he gets smart. Like they're gonna try to choke him at the time and take. The, but the but off. but at this oh. at this time, I mean, I know you were a fan of the one two three kid. You know, back in the day. I mean, did you think that he was gonna rise to the stardom that he would? I mean, I mean, I'm 11, so yeah, I think he's gonna be Intercontinental Champion. Well, there's no reason not for me to think that. I don't, I don't know that Vince loves fucking gassed up monsters because I'm 11. Oh, he loves. You know, I you know I thought like, oh, this guy is awesome. He's actually really big. He's if he was on the roster today, he would be one of the bigger guys on the wait, roster. Wait. You know, he's like six, he's six, six, one. Yeah. yeah. You know, six one probably. Uh, if I had to guess, he's probably two fifteen, maybe. Oh, back then. Yeah. Two twelve was his build weight, so probably yeah. closer to two hundred. I mean, it was it was a good match. I mean, the, 
a match that was not good. I mean, I, I don't know why they put Bret Hart taking on Doink the Clown with Jerry Lawler. I mean, I know why because Lawler was trying to get out of the match with Bret. Yeah, that's the whole concept. It's like, oh, we gotta fight Doink, and then you gotta fight me, and then, and then the dude. You know, I feel bad for Bret. I feel bad for Brett and I feel bad for Lawler. Brett's clearly not the top guy yeah. anymore. Jerry Lawler is not the Jerry Lawler from Memphis, and which made me very disappointed because I had watched Jerry Lawler beat Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage. So I thought when he came in the WWF that he's going to be the world champion because I watched him beat everyone all the time, not knowing that he owned half of Memphis. Yeah. <laughs> so... It's okay. I mean, eventually, you know, you would have, uh, you know, this feud would last on and off until like SummerSlam 95 until they have the Kiss My Foot match. Yeah. Which is uh, any of those kind of gimmick matches like that are kind of, kind of gross. But... Like Lola here, again, he has his like fucking joke book and shit, which is like his lame ass jokes. Like he's not Lawler in Memphis, and unless he's talking about the Hart, uh, uh, Stu and Helen Hart, that's fucking hilarious. But everything else is lame. Like be right before this pay per view, he does the thing with Tiny Tim and he breaks the ukulele, and and that shit's all fucking lame. I fucking mean, lame, uh, lame, lame. Okay, you know what was not lame? I mean, you may have disagreed with me, but the uh, whole Andy Kaufman stuff. I mean, no, that's fucking awesome. That's fucking dope as fuck, bro. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but that was vintage Jerry Law right there. But when he was in the WWF at yeah. this time, I was just like, I, I know he is part time. I know he's still in Memphis, and his Memphis stuff, I think, in the early '90s was suffering also. Um, he, this, yeah, this is not 1984 Lawler here. I mean, Lawler's still good in Memphis because he's, you know, he's in Memphis. But his WWF shit until he like, I never really liked. I never liked Lawler in the WWF at all, but I was rooting for him to beat the Miz for the WWF Championship that one time with yeah. the ladder match. But like Lawler on commentary was okay. He, I think he's overrated on commentary. Uh, like he's very attitude era ish, puppies, puppies, puppies yeah. type shit, right? And that, when you watch a couple of like 1998 pay-per-views that that's kind of yeah. grating after a while, to be honest. It's like, ugh, again. Uh, but he, you know, he's a good guy to have for Jim Ross. Like they complemented each other very well. And I don't think, you know, Jim Ross made adjustments. He made those adjustments when he was with Jerry Lawler. Because prior to this, even in WWE, he was very much WCW Mid South. Jim Ross talking about, yo, know, so I went to. You know, the Night Stalker here, he went to uh, Texas Tech University, and th he's the fucking Night Stalker. He didn't go to no fucking college. <laughs> um, what the fuck are you talking about, Jim oh Ross? Oh, God. Like, did he have the Night Stalker on the back of his fucking jersey? Like, what the fuck was that? Uh, Night Stalker being Brian Clark, also known as, as Adam Bomb, who debuted right before this pay-per-view also. He had the green eyes and the Adam Smasher and... And he's managed by our good friend, uh, Johnny oh, Polo. Oh, the great Johnny Polo. That was, uh, yeah. I mean. <laughs> I love Scotty the Body in Portland. Yeah, well, I mean, were you a big fan of Ravens? Are you still a big fan of Raven? Um, I like Raven. I like Raven's resurgence when in Ring of Honor, in the early days of Ring of Honor. And I like, I like, I, I like fucking Scotty Flamingo, WCW. Like, I liked all his incarnations. Um, to be completely honest, like Johnny Polo, Johnny Flamingo was more like how he normally is. Like he's not like he tells like all these bad dad jokes and shit like that. He thinks he fancies himself as a comedian. Um, and he is like a, he is a really funny like he's not he's not like super brooding, like depressed, you know, yeah. Raven. Um you know, he's more to me. He's more fucking Scotty Flamingo than fucking yeah. Raven. I mean, this is uh, the next match. We had Jerry Lawler taking on Brett Hitman Hart. I mean, they had Brett wrestle two matches in a row. Yeah, they put they put fucking Lawler in the fucking sharpshooter, and then you know Brett refused to break it. That's why Jerry Lawler won. Oh God, Jerry Lawler, he just should not have been in the ring at the time. And no, he can still go. You know, like like he. 
if they would have been like a straight up match between him and Brett, like a heat getting like, hey, this is Jerry Lawler versus Dutch Mantel, but we're just substituting Bre- uh, Bret Hart for Dutch Mantel would have been, would have been fine. Um, but it's very, you know, WWF, especially in 1983, 1984, 1995, Jerry Lawler is really like he's using that his stick as a crutch for a lot of the shit. And it just it doesn't hold up well, yeah. and it's not good. I mean, I don't know this. The next the next match is had a guy who I'm not a fan of, Ludwig Borga. No, Ludwig Borga. Take out Marty Jannetty. You mean you mean Brock Lesnar's father? Yeah, I'm not a fan of him. I I don't know why. I just like he looks just like fucking Brock Lesnar. God, bro, I hate Brock Lesnar. That's I hate him even more than I hate Virgil. But that's bad point. Yeah. Really? And you never even met Brock. You met Virgil. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, oh, I mean. Uh, Especially in the shower. Whoa. whoa. You know, you're going you to sit here and you're going to tell me that you never hung out with Virgil no. in the shower. Hey, you're a fucking liar. Hey, I told you that's rumor and innuendo, and there, there's no it's videotape of it anymore. So I'm just, just, just saying. Anyway, but I mean, what were your thoughts on Ludwig, Ludwig Borg? Ah. Uh, Fucking great look. Terrible I mean, wrestling. It's a great look if you're into guys, but um, it's not a... I mean, I'm, I'm not. He's no. not a pretty boy, right? He looks like he looks like a thinned out Brock yeah. Lesnar, and he had like this like the shoot fighter gimmick going at this time, which is very revolutionary, I guess. And he did, you know, he did do stuff in Japan and stuff like that, which you know. We, sometimes when we watch, you know, like, oh, Hulk Hogan is much better in Japan. Ludwig Borger is not much better in, in Japan. So he had a good look. He never really got it together in terms of in-ring, you know, ability. Uh, that was necessary for him to be a main eventer. If he got it, you know, if he got it together, he would have been a main eventer at WWF for sure, just based on his look alone. Beats the shit out of Marty Jannetty. He did this cool thing. He did an overhead toss into the fucking uppercut to the gut, which I really like that maneuver. It's really cool looking. Um, but yeah, he basically squashed Janetti, and you know he, they're looking at him right now as a possible opponent for WWF World Champion Lex Luger. Yeah, that doesn't happen. No, but I mean, you know, kind of a little known fact. You know, he he actually became a politician. Just yeah, he did. He did. He's also dead. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, mo- like most old wrestlers, they seem to die uh, horrible deaths. But yeah, it's just beside the point. Yeah, I mean, he died at forty-seven and shot himself. So, <laughs> well, I mean, what what can I say? I mean, he uh, he didn't get that push, so he decided. Actually, he wasn't kind of in a. I mean, he was kind of in a uh, a, a push, main event push after SummerSlam. I mean, with with Luger. Yeah, I mean, especially going into to Survivor Series. Yeah, but he had uh, uh the the Benoit syndrome apparently, so shot himself. Uh, Not to get dark. I mean, the CTE yeah. is fucked up. I mean, I don't know the whole Chris Benoit thing. It's just kind of sad because you know I've always said a great wrestler, but whenever I see his matches, it, that's you can only think about it. You know him killing himself. I haven't, I haven't watched I haven't watched WWE regularly um, since then. Like I don't yeah. I follow wrestling. I watch an occasional Raw. I watch a pay per view, um, but I. It, when the Ben was like, I just had my son too. So I couldn't even imagine doing that to, you know, your son. Yeah. Right. So yeah, at that point I stopped watching wrestling on a weekly basis. Every like I used to watch Monday Night Raw every week, SmackDown every week, like from, you know, 1997 through, you know, 2006 or 2007, whenever this, this yeah. happened, 2007, I think it was. Um, I'd watch straight through every week. And after that, I couldn't watch it every week anymore. And it was like, I would, I, like, I would catch like CM Punk stuff. That was it. Oh, <laughs> for a while. CM Punk, a the man years. who will probably never come back, but we'll, we'll see. But yeah, man. He's coming back. He's going to wrestle, uh, he's going to do independent yeah. shows. <laughs> yeah. God, the, this next match had the Undertaker with Paul Bear taking on. Oh God, the world's worst wrestler, Giant Gonzalez, with Harvey Whippleman. You think he's worse than Kali? No, no. Great Kali is just awkward and just. So you think you think Giant Gonzalez is better than Great Kali? A Kali-y? little, not much. You think he's better than Giant Silva? Eh, I don't know. 
I mean, he was not. Do you know uh, who no. John Silver is? You could have made that guy's okay. name up, and Ooh. I would have agreed. I have no idea who the fuck that. John Silver was. He wrestled in Japan. Sounds he also like you was could get, uh, you can get the done, goofy, you know, sleeping around. He was. You know, remember the oddities. You know this attitude era oddities. Luna, fucking earthquake underneath the mass as Golga, Kurgan, and then they had the giant silver. Maybe also. that was a time that I didn't watch. Uh, ICP. No. Oh, and, and St. Cloud ICP Posse? Time. Are you I'm a juggalo? A juggalo. But, uh, okay. I mean. Do you think a juggalo oh, is nuts? Is what hey, do. hey, hey, hey. This is a family. Sh- no, maybe not. Uh, I mean, the Undertaker. Not working. I mean, what were your guys. thoughts on the Undertaker in 94? All right, not, not, I mean, not Undertaker is in the Ultimate Warrior yeah. spot. Undertaker is in the Ultimate Warrior spot. When Ultimate Warrior didn't leave the WWF. He'd be fighting the Giant Gonzalez. The Undertaker's longevity is due to the fact that he was fighting whatever fucking creature or monster that they could find, and that's what the Warrior would have been doing if he didn't quit get fired. So yeah, Undertaker is facing your Giant Gonzalez's and your Kamala's and your King Kong Bundy's and your nails and. And all your weirdos uh, for a while until they figured out, oh, shit, he can actually fucking work. Let's put him in the ring with someone that can actually go. So so eventually we get to Bret Hart matches and Shawn Michaels matches. Yep, and... Um, yeah, that, that fucking... That fucking... The first time in the cell is a fucking dope-ass fucking match. I think that's the first time when you realize I'll fucking take it. Yeah, and, and all these years later, he's still wrestling. Oh, he's still fucking going. And they, they just need to leave, let him rest in peace. Oh, yeah, he, what do you think he? What do you think he's making per shot? Because I know he's not on a, a contract. Lot. I I, I, what do you don't think know. he's making per shot? You think it's over hundred thousand yep. dollars a match? I, th- I think I think more than okay, that, man. but I could be wrong. But I mean, people still love the Undertaker. They hear that music. How much more? How much more money do you need, bro? I like, mean, it's it's, it's kind of like I mean, being a wrestler is kind of like a disease. It's, I, mean, I know it's, it's like fucking it's like fucking herpes like once you think it's out of your system hey, it comes it's right like, I mean back. it's kind of in a smaller you know smaller note like I mean because yeah you smaller <laughs> note ring announcing I'm just like I, every time I get out of it and then someone says hey you want to do it again I'm like fuck yeah and it's just it, it's like a drug it's like a it's like a disease like which a, you know, a crack yes yeah, so, yeah, it's it's like like crack what do you think Jake liked better wrestling or crack uh crack but speaking of, so of, of, of wrestlers that uh, I don't think you're a fan of, um, he, a, a guy, a, a, a wrestling wrestler, former wrestler from the WWE, showed up at a Georgia promotion this past Friday. It was uh, the former Big Cass. He showed up at an indie show um, that Jake the St. Roberts was on. But um, to, I don't mind Big Cass. Enzo is a Big fucking Cass. idiot. He... he Enzo reminds me of every bad New York stereotype. Is he is he like every bad stereotype of New York, or is it just, or is it overblown? Yeah, yeah no, that he's. There's not many people in New York who are like Enzo, but every negative quality that people associate with New Yorkers, Enzo has. Then he get he gets in verbal arg- arguments with uh, Joey Janela at Blink One Eighty Two concerts. What? Why the fuck is Enzo at a Blink One Eighty Two concert? It seems like no. not his scene. I like, mean, two, I don't know. I just think I think I went to a Blink One Eighty Two concert. I think it was like two thousand two or some shit. It was at the uh, at Jones Beach here in Long Island. It's pretty good. Tampa Hill was there too. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I don't think I don't know if his 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 uh, his shtick. Is you know kind of like I always talk about Virgil about how he's an asshole. Um, do you think that he is kind of living the gimmick? It's like he people expect. I don't think. I think that's him. I don't think. I don't think. I've never heard anyone say, "Oh, fucking Enzo, he's fucking cool as shit." Like, no, everyone that fucking ever dealt with him is like, "This is how he's he a total is." Piece of shit. He's a tool yeah, man. I mean, hey. But surprisingly enough, again, I told you this at WrestleCon. Fucking big line for Enzo. I was surprised. I was shocked because you know, you had a lot of Smarty fans in there for WrestleMania weekend. I figured, you know, it wasn't like Joey Ryan's line. When I thought that would be much bigger, and it yeah. wasn't big at all. Like Enzo had a bigger line than Joey Ryan. Yeah, you so were in that. You like, were in that line too, weren't you? Not the Joe. I was next to him in the really long line for Tessa Blanchard. Oh, yeah. Oh, she who smells like like vanilla and and and. And she is all the Excellent. way live. She is Not all the way creepy, live. Though. Holy shit. Creepy. 
I'm just saying she's not. And she's super nice. That's, you know, man. No, because it's like, and, and it made it more distinct because wrestling fans don't like to watch time to time. Not those who listen to this show or those who I know personally, because you guys take showers. But the ones I often see at live events and conventions, for some reason, I don't know. They soap. I don't know. They, they, were, they were in the hotel because I used the ones in the hotel. They were pretty yeah. good. So I don't know what happened. So like when you smell someone who doesn't smell like armpit and ass and she smelled like cotton candy and vanilla, it really stood yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, yeah, I was surprised. I mean, you didn't smell weird. It was, I mean. No, because I fucking, dude, I, not only do I shower, I shower twice a day because I'm obnoxious. That's beside the point. But... Brush my teeth four times, shower twice. I brush my teeth once and shower uh uh, a nine. You don't brush uh, your teeth nine. after meals? Not right after Why meals. Not? Like, like oh, if no, I'm in a fucking restaurant, like, I don't go. Well, let me go to the, let me go to the bathroom. Oh, of and course, brush. I mean there's the pocket ones. There's a there's the pocket little toothbrush things that you could use. I don't I don't I don't go take it that far. But if I go out to a restaurant and I'm back home in 45 minutes or an hour, I'll go upstairs and fucking brush my uh, brush my teeth no. every once in a while. I don't. Uh, Maybe because I'm a smoker. Yeah, that I do that too. I hate. I don't like smoke smell, and I smoke, so I'm really like insane with that. Do you hate yourself? Yeah, You're like, well, God, I hate the smell of smoke, but I'm. A, I... Most people will tell me I don't smell like smoke. What do they tell you? Smell like what do they and tell they you? Actually, smell very. Like? Um, like Michael Jordan, cologne, and uh, Shane historically. Uh, yeah, I mean, what? I still wear Michael Jordan cologne. It's still available. You can buy it on you can Amazon. Buy anything on Amazon. It's orange citrus. And some sort of wood <laughs> is the actual uh, fragrance of Michael Jordan's cologne. Oh, I want to smell like citrus really and available. wood. That just, yeah. Well, like wood shavings. Like, come on. Like, you probably, what do you wear? Cool water? You're a cool water man? You buy that from your local CVS? I don't wear, do I don't wear? wear cologne. Well, we know that because you smell like fucking armpit and ass. That's why. Uh, well. But, you know, you probably wear the cool water, right? Or the Stetson, you're a Stetson man, English I, leather. I mean, what can I? High karate. I uh, actually, uh, it was funny. A, uh, it's funny. NASCAR makes a. Uh, you know, I'm a big NASCAR fan, and uh, yes. Are you? You like watching people driving? I do. I like watching, like Ooh, watching grown men drive in cars. That's beside the point. They made a. Uh, it made a Daytona 500 uh, smelling uh, cologne. I didn't buy. It smell like gasoline and fucking Ed, Ed exhaust. rubber, but that's. Uh, Yo, I want to get that fucking nitro cologne. What did that smell like? I don't know, but I can I don't know what nitro cologne smelled like, but it's WCW cologne. Surprised they never fucking made arrogance. That would have been as I a mean, product. I, if, if, they, awesome. if they did it now, I, th- if, I think if they they oh they should they fucking definitely. That, should. I mean, people would buy that and put it in a bottle that kind of looked like the uh, it'd be a bigger bottle like the atomizer <laughs> like. I'd be fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what nitro would smell like. I mean, would it smell like? Uh, I, don't I don't know. know. I don't know the the girls that like the fish girls that go feet. home with wrestlers. I don't know. So, but, uh, <laughs> oh god, I well that well we could anyway. We won't talk about that. That's that's on the Patreon show if you want to hear about that. But the next match we had the Smoking Guns, Bart Gun, Billy Gun taking on Tatanka. Bam Bam Bigelow and the Head Shrinkers with Afa and Luna Vachon in a six man tag team match. Your thoughts? Isn't it weird that, uh, not to be whatever the fuck? Not to be weird. Do you think it's weird to have Cowboys and Indians <laughs> on the same team? Uh, yeah. Right? That's weird. That is. And then you have like, there's a, there's a bunch of different stereotypes here. So you have your smoke, you have your. your Prototypical cowboys. You have your Native American, and then you have your uh, your island savages on one side, and then you have Bam Bam Bigelow with his head tattoo. I mean, I so. I, I, I want to get a tattoo just like Bam Bam. It's his head. I would just that'd be awesome. Do you? Yeah, I mean, you definitely have the head. And I, and speaking of looking up stuff, I, I speaking of head, Luna was I, I did look her up. You know, I'd look at some pictures of her because you said that she was attractive with that. Or, Without yeah. all the shit, yeah, like yeah, she's not she a monster. Yeah, she's definitely, um, yeah, she was. She can get it. She's a, uh, you know, like you say, not for nothing. She was, uh, she was good looking. So, 
You, yeah, you can get a. She can go sixty minutes with the champ. She could ride Space Mountain. I'm sure. So. Who else can ride Space Mountain? Fucking Aqua. Yeah. yeah. Aqua trained. I did not know that, but you need to. Have you ever ridden Space Mountain? I have ridden Space it's, Mountain. Uh, yeah. It's it's very fast, and it's kind of like uh, anyway, that's. It's a it's it's a roller coaster inside. In the dark. Dark. And I know you're. Which is good. Which makes I think in some cases it makes it less scary because you don't see, you don't see the fucking pavement that you're, if you're going to fly off you're going to crash into. So in a lot of ways it's not as scary as say as a, you know, scream machine at fucking the Great Adventure. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, or Nitro or Viper or whatever it's called, King the Car. We have King the Car now. Man. You, you know what? You, I've decided. Um, I know what I'm going to get you for your birthday. Pocket pussy? <laughs> uh, no, I'm gonna get a slate. No, I'm gonna get you some oil for your okay. chair. Just saying, but you know. Man. Hey, what? fuck face. You have two choices: this fucking chair or the wooden chair right next to me, which also makes wooden what chair the fuck noises. Is wooden chair noises. The... You ever fucking sat in no. a wooden chair? It no. fucking creeps. Who the hell sits in? It creaks more than fucking this one. Okay. Uh, do you have wooden chairs in your house? Like, what do you what do you sit on? Fucking bean bags? No, I, I sit on a sofa. You do this no, on a sofa. I'm currently sitting. Is it a pull out? Oh, sofa? I don't pull out. <laughs> do you know how to pull out? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I have a kid. That. Um, that's beside the point. No, I'm sitting in. I'm sitting in the uh, in the retro wrestling rewind massive studios here in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Battery USA, home of the greatest rock and fuck and roll band of all time. The fabulous Freebirds, Michael P.S. Hayes. Just wanted to say that. They are rock stars. They're not rock you stars. Know, speaking of rock stars, you would... Th- We're talking about Mad Mountain Rock. Got, no, uh, oh, uh... Remember that WWF guitar? That was speaking cool. Speaking of, uh, kind of going on a different note, WCW, what was the, oh, the guy with the guitar? Oh, um... It's Max Payne. That's Mad Mountain Rock. That's what I was talking I don't about. Know. They, they, they changed the game. Remember, he took the Brad Blaster from Johnny Bad and fucking hit him in the face with it. Like you fucking blasted him in the face with his load. <laughs> oh God. Speaking. Then Johnny Bad had to wear this mask thing yeah. for a while. Speaking of guys who had a great run and then just they dropped the ball, Lex Luger. You know, man. He failed America. And he killed Miss Elizabeth. Wow. That's, he's not, you're not wrong, but wow. I, I mean, hey, I, I, th- I think if he hears this uh, episode, he will not want to be on the podcast. I'm just saying. Well, uh, I think he admits that now. But what, 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 that he doesn't want to be on the podcast or that he killed Miss Elizabeth? He was involved. I mean, I think he takes accountability for some of that I mean, shit. Well, you know, not, I don't know. I just, 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 so many people that are dead that how wrestling would have been better if like, if say Miss Elizabeth had died, if um, Bobby Heenan hadn't died, if Bobby Heenan had been able to talk in the end of his life. Imagine a Bobby Heenan podcast right now. It would be the number one podcast ever. It would be number one. It would be number one on every chart in the history of, of, of podcasts. It would just be awesome. I just, it just, I don't want to, he, it just kind of sucked that he got cancer. Yeah. Cancer sucks. Yeah. Guys, check out. My penis. Um, <laughs> no, we won't do that. You need a micro- microphone for that shit. Check out one of Bobby's final interviews where like before he loses kind of his vocal cords, he does an RF video yeah. shoot interview, which I suggest. I, I will, I will. Oh, I will check, check that out, but I mean, what were your thoughts? I mean, Luger defeating y- Yokozuna. He failed America. Yokozuna. He failed himself. He failed everyone. Um, this destroyed his push. Destroyed what he was going to be in the WWF. And you know, it's not Luger's fault that this happened. There's nowhere in fuck's sake they're going to put the belt on WrestleMania ten. It makes no fucking sense. It's much like having Hogan come in. He's gonna wrestle the Iron Sheik and win by fucking count out. You don't do that dumb shit. You have him go over. 
fucking go over. He beats fucking Yoko, and then figure it out after that. But to have you like you wasted all that time. You wasted that money on that fucking bus <laughs> that broke down. And you, and, you, and and you wasted all this money on TV time for someone who you're going to give this push to and not finish it. Fucking I mean, finish it. Have him win the belt and then figure it out afterwards. Even if he drops the belt the next night on fucking I Raw. Mean, but, okay, so he has to win here. He looks like a doofus, you know, riding on the shoulders of the Steiners with the balloons coming down, and he wins by fucking count out. Yeah, I mean, do, do, you, do you actually, okay, the bus, the Lex Express, do you think it actually went around the country? Did it actually go around the country? Yeah, it did. It, it did. Watch the, watch the documentary on, on, the, on, on, the, the, on the Lex uh, Express? On the network. I will yeah. definitely watch that. But um, You can tell that Lex Luger hated every fucking minute of that shit. You think he hated kind of the gimmick that they had they kind of put him in? Yeah, I, Lex Luger not the, at the time. Lex is a changed man. He's, found, he's that's why we can rip him. We can rip him a little bit because he's a changed man. He's, he'll forgive he's us. He's found Jesus, right? Yeah, so he'll forgive us. Um, but you could tell that he didn't enjoy the fans. Uh, he didn't have an appreciation for the fans. Um, I don't think he had appreciation for the push that he was given. I don't think he had an understanding of, you know. You know, he got the first big time contract, like first big time guaranteed contract in professional wrestling. Always made money since like day one in wrestling. He didn't really have to pay dues. Like he wasn't Steve Austin eating cans of fucking tuna fish to survive on in Memphis. You know, he came in with a big push. So I think when it came down to winning the WWF championship, I don't think he necessarily um, enjoyed himself. On like, I think if, looking, I think he would say this himself that he didn't. You know, have an appreciation or like, hey, I'm like, I'm going to go cross country here. Now, he wasn't on the bus a lot of the times. He would fly and meet the bus at the airport. And then they would go around town or whatever. But was Luger the guy in 93 to replace Hogan? I don't think Hogan can be replaced. And that's why you go with a Bret Hart. Or you could have gone with, I don't know if you're going to have the the former drug dealing uh, Razor Ramon as, as as your world champion. Um, so, you know, Luger, if, if Luger was total package Lex Luger, babyface total package Lex Luger, he probably gets a shot, but the gimmick was just way too over the top. And it's funny now, because you see Luger for those two years, because he left in 95, still in that gimmick. And then no, no character development whatsoever, nothing. Then you see him back in WCW, he's wearing like the black trunks, and they, oh, it, it, it just... Oh, that's yeah. the Lex I remember. And it's a damn shame because Lex Luger, from a from a kayfabe career standpoint, never got that win over Flair for the WCW title. Now, he did win it, but he beat Barry. Um, and he never never won the WWF championship. And I think those are very much black marks against him in terms of mm-hmm. uh, you're looking at his career in terms of kayfabe. Yeah. So he never won the big one. And eventually, he, he did beat Hogan. On probably one of the best episodes of Nitro ever, uh, but he still never beat. I don't think he ever beat Flair for that title. I mean, it was Not kind of a shame. I mean, they title. were pushing him big in uh, NWA. I mean, you know, as a, you know, before. I think I think I think people. He got better. He got really, like he was really good. Like Luger eighty nine ninety, and then Luger ninety five into ninety six. Like he, those are four really good yeah. years for Luger. The rest of the time is not no. the greatest. Not the not the bell. But no, neither was the Ultimate Warrior. Neither is the yeah. Thousand Guys. Like he's a better worker than yeah. Warrior for sure. I mean, and uh, kind of an overall grade on this show. I mean, what would I mean? Once you let's see, how many good matches uh, were on one, this show? One. Which uh, one is that? DiBiase. I mean, Razor DiBiase. I mean, Razor DiBiase. Um, like they went fucking eighteen minutes with Luger and Yoko too. That's way too long for those guys. So like, I'd give it a five. Yeah, I'd give it probably a six. Go watch. No, don't don't watch this pay per view. Watch the six weeks of TV before this pay per view. It's actually really really good, and you get this really disappointing pay per view. I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, you get the debut of Men on the Mission. I'm not being facetious. Like it's fun. Like they took no, their time with them. Speaking of, I mean, I don't really call it. 
they're on I don't really call it disappointing, but the the show that we're covering next week is ECW's November to Remember 1995. Oh, I mean, it was, yeah. It's ECW 1995. ECW 1995, 1996, I consider the peak of their creativity. Um, ECW is funny because they have like different eras, but they're very short because they weren't around for very long. Heck, TNA has been around longer than they were. Um, but you have your Eastern Championship Wrestling era. You have this 90, 95, 96 era. You have the, you know, those the Shane Douglas like 97, 98, 99 era. And then you have like we're about to close era of like nine, nine, 2000, 2001. Like, like we're like Carino and Just Incredible on top. So, you know, it's it, they're very they're very different. But I think creatively, and then you know, in terms of having an effect on your wrestling culture, this, the peak is ninety five or ninety six. So. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was definitely not the. I wasn't a big ECW fan, but you know, I mean, that's. Did you get ECW? We what channel did you get it on? Nope. At all. Like here it was on the MSG network. The first thing I remember seeing in the ECW were the Steiner Brothers. So I'm flipping to the channels like 1 o'clock in the morning. And I see the Steiner Brothers and like Eddie Guerrero. I'm like, what the? F- Here's where the Steiners went. What the fuck is this? And like, you know, a couple of weeks or a month or two later, I see Steve Austin. And again... Big WCW guy. So I see the Steiner brothers and I see Steve Austin. I'm going to watch whatever show this is. And then, you know, I'm like, this is so fucking bananas. Yeah, I mean, but yeah. Because, you know, when you watch the show, we're watching literally the, 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 the full show. And there's no promos on this show. There's no interviews on this show, really. You know, there's no hype on this show. So it's very plain. Like, if you're going to watch ECW, probably the preferred method is you know, look at whatever show you want to watch, say Hostile City Showdown, and then watch the four TV shows that happen after it because they 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 show the matches on TV. It's just in the ECW TV show, which the ECW TV show at the time was fucking really good. Yeah, I mean... So that's probably the preferred method of doing it. But to review a show, you got to watch the whole thing because they edit the fuck out of those matches. So so for you for you to get a view of like the overall show you have to watch literally like the raw show yeah but we'll we'll be covering that next week but for the great alex g as always i'm david fine we will see you back here next week where we covers cover ecw's november to remember 1995 like i always say we'll talk to you in the past And 38 pounds in the black corner. From St. Louis. Here comes Mr. Cole. Andre the Giant. Get his the bruiser. Oh, oh. Number one, the greatest WWE champion of all time, and in many ways, the man who made the title what it is today, Bruno Sammartino. His opponent weighing 236 pounds in the white corner. From Van Nuys, California.